so you wouldn't have a virtual environment for that um, for that tool. You'll just need to, uh, yeah, you'll just want to access uh, that tool from outside a virtual environment. So you might want to use uh, the user flag. Um, also, you can install um, a package for the system if you're outside of, an, of, of a, a virtual environment by using uh, by doing a pip install with sudo. Um, also, uh, if you don't want to install from PyPy, you can install local pa uh, packages by just doing a pip install uh, period, or um, you can install specific packages from a requirements file using this command. Um, uninstall, and like we saw yesterday, and I think you did before, um, even before then, uh, pip freeze, which is usually used to create, uh, or can be used to create uh, requirements files. Uh, okay, and then uh, I'm going to introduce uh, introduce a bit the Journal of Open Source Software. So, um, if you've uh, created a software package for your research um, and you want to share it, you think it'll be useful to other people, you might even consider uh, wanting to submit it to the Journal of Open Source Software. Um, and the reason I'm presenting this in this lecture is because they actually have a checklist of what they request or what they would like you to have within uh, your uh, package. So in their documentation, um, you can see their checklist for review. Um, so they look for things like is your, is the source code of for the software available? Does it have a license? Does it have a section that details contribution uh, authorship? Um, is uh, installation outlined and is it easy to do? That could be like, uh, is it in PyPy and can you simply do a pip install? Um, have you, well, functionality, so do you have sufficient test cases? Um, and then stuff like that. So, uh, I mean, you might not necessarily want to submit your a software package to JOS, uh, to JOS but um, it's always good to maybe have a look at their checklist and um, see what they're looking for. And ultimately, if you have everything that's in their checklist, then, uh, then your software package should be good to go. Um, no, sorry. There's, there's a question from the chat, Valerie, from Kendra, who's asking, what happens when you install a local package? What's the difference between an, un an uninstalled and installed local package? So, uh, so what you do when you, so, um, hmm, let's see how I can show this. So, um, I know, uh, okay. Um, sorry. Now I'm making typos, but essentially, um, okay, so here I have um, some code. It's not on PyPy and I want to install it so I can do a pip install um, this package. So now it's installing the local package and what I can do is when I access Python, I can use it like any other package um, that you would have installed from PyPy. So there's, it's just, the thing with the local package is does is just that it resides locally. So um, if you don't have any, or if you have something that you want to test out, which is not necessarily on PyPy, you might want to install it. Or if you're building a package but you're not ready for release to PyPy, um, and you want to see how it works with pip install, you might install it uh, locally. Um, so now I can use, I can do. It's not going to work, but. Um, what is it called? Colors, color, or I can do help CMB. And I'll show you the contents of the package. So in CMB, um, you have a file name run.py. That's it. Um, but yeah, so it's like installing it from PyPy. Um, but it's just the file resides locally. So you're not installing it from there. But everything else is exactly the same. And uh, maybe we should explain, we could explain too that installing even from PyPy doesn't just mean downloading the package. It downloads the package, one from PyPy, and then it copies the files to, to um, whatever directory is required for Python to find them. 
So it's more like it would it would move the files, copy the files to the to a directory that Python can find, and that directory can be either system wide if we don't use minus minus user, or just in the user home, or in a virtual environment. Yeah, um, but the and the same goes for a local install in the sense that so it needs a setup.py. I'll do this extra step because we don't actually have the pre-built files yet. So it'll build and install here and install uh, the install process is actually just the process of copying the files uh, to a location where Python can find it. Yeah, so Kendra followed up on her question. Uh, I'm also meant what does the computer do to install it? I guess, I guess that's the answer. The modules get added yeah. to a path or something. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You see that uh, on, uh, on various console, uh, the path is actually lib Python 3.7 site package. If you scroll up a few lines, yeah, and yeah. apparently, Valerie, you're using a virtual environment, so that's, that's why it's in dot the end. But yeah. you know, otherwise, it would be something like user local Python and then lib Python 3.7. So, yeah, if you go in my VM, so lib um, Python site packages and then you should see them all about well, everything I installed and here is my package this is my local one so it's right here it's in CMB and then here and then there's the egg file which is just a metadata file so you can go to CMB and then what it does it have it has my run.py file which is my executable which I can run and my init uh, which we'll go over later. But essentially what it does is, uh, so a local install is build and then copy the file over um, if they're not pre-built already, or um, if it's from PyPy, then they'll just try to find the pre-built files and uh, install, the, well, copy them over and then uh, put them to the correct uh, directory. Okay, so. Um, so yeah, so and an example of a uh, JAWS publication is uh, PyBids and it's cool because you can even see what the review process is like, which I find pretty neat. Um, so yeah, so you can, uh, for every uh, JAWS publication, you can see the review, see what they were looking for. Um, here they have the checklist and the, the, like that the authors meet all the requirements. So it's very neat. Um, then, yeah. Just just a, a few more comments on just, um, I think it's a great, it's really a great way to, uh, to make value out of, of your software. So, you know, I guess several of you during their masters or PhD will be developing substantial amounts of software. And of course you can write papers on the software or using the software, but having one which is specifically on the software itself, I think is a, is a, is a very good thing to make, you know, software also a first class uh, research artifacts. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, the goals for today are to understand um, the files that are required in a Python package. So what do they do? Why are they there for? And also the organizational structure of it. Um, and then we'll look at writing a setup script to enable installation through PIP. And then finally, we'll learn how to publish um, a project to PyPy. Um, sorry, so. Uh, yeah. So um, initial files, when you create a project, you should have something like your package directory a license file, a readme that can be, it's accepted in many formats for Python, so it could be a markdown, um, an RST or a text file, a manifest.in, and then you can have various versions of a setup file. So it could be a setup.py, setup.config, or a pyproject.toml. Um, this is a bit of a mess, but uh, we'll look at it later. Uh, okay, so what is a Python package? Well, um, so what you probably have right now are modules, which are just regular Python scripts. So anything that ends in uh, .py file is a module. It'll have um, function definitions, maybe classes in there. Um, but either way, all of those are modules. And a package is just a directory containing an init.py file. 
so uh, let's see. I'm going to deactivate my current um, uh, or install. Let's see if this is CMD. Okay, so um, let's do deactivate. And uh, let's do uh, Python um, VM. I'm just going to create uh, another virtual environment called exactly the same thing, which is great. But, okay, so source VM slash bin slash activate. And then I'm just going to, uh, so, okay, now nothing's installed. I just have, uh, yeah. Okay, so I just have a run.py file locally and uh, remove. Okay, um, so let's say I make a directory called um, test and I put run in there. So uh, move run.py to test. If I go in Python, uh, so wait, so first ls test, see it has the run.py file in there. So if I open my Python interpreter and I say import test, uh, it worked, why? Uh, okay, uh, import test.run. Okay, it is working. Why is this? Sorry, so. Uh, so technically, anyway, te technically what you need is a touch in a .py file. Uh, and this would convert it to a directory. Now this is a cat in a .py. This is just an empty file. Uh, test, sorry. So there's nothing in there. It didn't return anything. This is just an empty file. And this tells to Python that it is a package and uh, not just a directory to ignore. And what it allows you to do is you can do the dot note, you can use the dot notation with it. So then you can do the test.run and that should work. It's just I'm missing modules. So if I had done um, pip install, my bubble and the pillow, which are the required packages for this, um, it will it will successfully import the file. Uh, so, and then you can do, and then in my um, run file, there's a function called color. So then I can do from uh, test run import color and that will work as well and then I can use the color function here except for it's missing uh, input files. Um, okay so that is all that so a module is just a python file and then a package it just requires the init.py to tell Python that it is a Python package. And what this does is once it gets flagged as a Python package, you can use the dot notation. So here, um, you know, in sound, you have sound as a package. And it, inside, it has a sub package called effects, which also has an init.py, um, which makes it a sub package. And then it has the echo module. And that allows you to do import sound.effects.echo. All right, uh, everything good so far? Any questions? Maybe a quick one. Um, so in your example, init.py is empty. Are there yeah. situations where we could put stuff in there? I mean, I know the answer is yes, but yeah. uh, I'm not sure exactly in which configuration, I mean, in which situation we would do that. So um, let's just say, uh, so one reason that you wanna um, populate stuff in your init.py is uh, let's say uh, you have, a module with a bunch of functions. And when you import, you want to allow uh, users to import um, all the functions in that module 
and all the mod, all the function, or you might not want to allow them to import all the functions, but a certain subset of them, maybe you have some um, private functions that don't necessarily need to be accessed by the user. Either way, um, you'll specify an all in your init.py and for all you'll list um, the functions that can be imported when you import your module. Uh, another reason you'd want to um, include maybe some code in your init.py is let's just say that you have some initialization code that um, you'll need for all the functions in your or all the modules in your package, you can put it directly in the init.py. So by default, it could be empty, um, but you might have some scenarios where you'd want to populate it with yeah, either thanks. code. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so next is licenses. Um, so uh, all open source projects should have a license. Uh, a license uh, basically details what um, users of your project can do with it. Can they distribute it, modify, um, anything. Uh, but yeah, so it kind of lists the set or the restrictions and the allowances for how they can interact with your package. Uh, now you might think that no license means that people are free to do whatever they want with your project, but in fact, it's the inverse. So no license means uh, it's exclusive copyright, which means if anyone um, interacts with your project, it's technically illegal, they can, but it can be taken down at any time. Uh, and so uh, there are a few popular licenses. I know Elizabeth kind of covered this a bit in the first week. Um, so, uh, but yeah, but three popular ones are the MIT, the GPL v3, and the Apache license 2.0. Um, they differ in what they permit and um, they permit users to do. A lot of the times for my projects, I'll use the MIT license, which is a simple license. Um, basically, uh, I mean, it gives a lot of permissions uh, for uh, contributors or users of your code. Um, and it allows you to, or allows users to include your package, even in closed source code. Whereas GPL v3, um, it has, I believe it has to remain uh, open source. So if users want to use it, their code has to be open. Um, now, another thing to consider is if you're working, uh, or if you want to contribute to a project, you'll probably want to um, maintain the license used by the community. So um, try to see what they're using and then use that for your project. Um, but yeah, but this website is really great to, um, and to help you decide uh, which license uh, you should use for your project. Um, so go here um, and yeah. And another thing which I want to show is, is so maybe you, um, Maybe you built uh, your repository without a license. Uh, I guess I close it. So here, so here I have an example repository. This is the code I was using. It has no license. Um, so how do I add one? Well, GitHub actually makes this rather easy. Um, so there are two ways of going about it. You can do a create new file, and then start typing out license. Dot, and you'll see this will pop up choose a license template and then they give you all the options that you can select from or uh, an even easier way is to go in insights and community and here they'll tell you what your um, what are the recommended community standards and uh, like what your project is missing and you can go in the under license and click add so um, really you can add a license at any time it they give you the option when you're creating your repository, but in case you haven't done it, you can do it now super easily um, through GitHub. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I know all of you, I, well, yeah, I know all of you have a readme already and probably have a general idea of what it is, but essentially it's a file. It contains information about your project, uh, well, it contains the project name, description about your project, um, how it can be installed. So if it's a Python project, you would normally have like a pip installation, um, which, uh, and then usage. So how can users interact with your code, support, if they have any issues, how can they ask for help? Uh, if they wanna contribute, how can they do so? Um, and the license, and there are uh, resources to help you uh, create a readme file. Uh, 
So Make a Readme has uh, even examples and sample markdown that you can use to create a readme file. And this is also important because in the end, it ends up uh, like uh, you copy your readme information also to uh, PyPy. So when people look at your package in PyPy, they can get um, the readme details of how to use it and how to interact with it. Um, now, your project can also have a manifest.in file. Uh, so when you build or uh, yeah, when you build your project, um, only certain files are included. So it'll usually look for Python and C source files, um, and then also, you know, setup files, readme files, um, and uh, the manifest file. So those will be included in your builds. However, uh, sometimes you have additional files that you'd want to include. For example, maybe you'd want to include a brain atlas um, in your build so that users can refer, when interacting with your code, they can leverage that brain atlas. Um, that's already pre-built with your package. So uh, what you do is you uh, include it in your manifest.in. So you'd say that you'd want this, uh, you know, your brain atlas to be included in the build. And then uh, the manifest.in file will add it to your build, will ensure that it's added to your build. Uh, now, if you, and also if there are extra files that have been included by default, but you don't want them to be included in your build, you can also remove them by specifying it in the manifest.in file. So, okay, okay uh, now the default way to build um, Python projects right now at the moment is through using setup tools. Uh, so yeah, so it's just a Python library designed to facilitate the packaging of Python projects. And it uses, for the time being, it's um, setup.py or setup.config files to do so. And once those uh, files are packaged, are packaged, then you can um, build it into what is known as a Python wheel. And uh, then your project is ready to be uh, published to PyPy. So what is a setup.py? Um, basically, it kind of looks like this. Um, so you'll have metadata on your project, like what is the name, the version, the author, email, um, a description, a long description could be your readme file, um, and stuff like that. It also looks for what are the packages in your repository, um, and then also uh, information, what kind of programming language you need, is there a minimum? So for this example, it, your Python version needed to be greater than Py Python 3.6, um, and yeah, license metadata. So it has the MIT license and operating system. It's uh, OS independent. So pip uses this to install um, packages. So essentially, once you have a setup.py file, you can start doing using the command pip install period, and it should be able to install your package from um, from there. Um, and yeah, and there's also, um, so if you have, um, if your project requires or has dependencies that need to be installed, um, you can uh, specify an install requires in your setup.py. So, uh, and here, like, uh, and I know that some of you might be uh, familiar with the requirements of text files and, um, might be curious into what is the difference between an install requires and the requirements of text. So, um, when uh, so the install requires is used in your setup.py and it tells pip what packages are need to be installed for uh, your package to work. Um, and a requirements text file is just it just details your environment. So at a specific time, you had you ran your code with. Uh, these, these libraries at the specific version, using the specific version. And that can be all included in a requirements.txt file. Um, whereas install require, uh, requires is just the minimal list of dependencies to make your package work. So a uh, requirements.txt file and an install requires can have the same content. Um, but essentially, uh, you'd want, if they do have the same content, then uh, 
requirements of text should be as minimal as the install requires. I'm sorry, let me just see. Uh, so yeah, so uh, for that, you can just use pip freeze uh, to see all packages that were installed and their versions. So here, so you see I have NiBubble uh, version 3.1.0 installed, NumPy um, 1.18.4 and so forth. Um, yeah. Sound good? You know, uh, yeah. About um, requirements.txt versus setup.py, is requirements.txt used by peep at all? I mean, I always, no. uh, what I do, I always actually have both, you know, my packages in both places, but why is it useful to have requirements.txt at all? Um, yeah, I, you don't actually need it to build your project. So there's no, like, it's mostly a install required. I mean, re install requires is all that's required, I guess, if you, if you wanted a user to have the exact same environment that you did when running, I mean, the exact same Python environment, then um, they can install it from the requirements.txt file. But in okay. essence, it's not really required for, uh, for okay. your project. Uh, also, I know that um, like when you build your code, I might be able to show that later, uh, you'll see that the build package actually includes a requirements.txt file with the minimal uh, list of dependencies. So essentially what was in your install requires. Okay. And there's uh, a follow-up question by Emily. Um, how would you know which ones are needed? So which ones of the packages you showed with uh, pip freeze are needed specifically for your script? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. Um, I think the best way is to look at the packages that you import in your code. Although sometimes it's, yeah. Um, so let's say in my code, I have um, test slash run. So I import NiBubble, so I know that I need NiBubble at least. Um, I've imported Pillow um, and NumPy, so I would at least need those packages. Now NumPy is provided by uh, NiBubble, um, so it could in install requires it could just be NiBubble and Pill. Um, but yeah, but I go through what you've imported or what packages you've imported in your code as those are for sure all dependencies of your project. I don't know if Tristan or Greg have a better check for doing that. No, it sounds good. Yep. Yeah. And then pip freeze actually includes the packages you've imported and declared and their dependencies. Yeah. Yeah, and I usually prune the um, the outputs of the pip freezes I showed yesterday, just because it'll include a bunch of downstream dependencies that we don't necessarily care about and will be reinstalled with the, you know, ones we actually are importing. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So, yeah, so requirements.txt not necessarily required, but if you want to um, reinstall your exact environment that you had before, you can have a requirements.txt file where it's really required is um, like a, where you really need to specify your dependencies is actually in an install requires. Um, okay, so now there's, so we went through setup of the pie, but there's also setup.config and it's essentially the same thing, or I can do, uh, you can specify uh, all your metadata within that you would specify in a setup the pie and your setup.config. Uh, and usually this is actually, um, Per, or it's starting to be preferred over um, setup.py because setup.py has, uh, if you can see, it actually comes with a dependency, which is setup tools. Um, so uh, a setup.config can be read um, without having the setup tools dependency installed. Um, and um, and then there's a third file type, which I had uh, briefly mentioned at the beginning called pyproject.toml. Now this is the one that is ultimately preferred over them both, uh, just because um, setup.config has this issue that um, 
the definition is not um, is not straightforward and it changes between uh, Python versions. So this might be completely different depending on your the Python version that you're using. And so pyproject.toml is actually more um, rigorously defined. Um, and they're thinking of including that in setup tools. So sorry. So there is a whole, uh, this is the setup tools repo and they're looking to add support for pyproject.toml. And so this is, it's not done yet, but this is probably something to keep an eye on because maybe um, the standards of should you have a setup.py or setup.config or pyproject.toml will change um, very soon. Um, but for the time being, it's okay to have a setup.py. Uh, it's also okay to have a setup.config. I mean, either of them, it shouldn't affect your project uh, in any way, but if you want to keep up with the changes that are happening, then uh, maybe eventually you'll want to move on to pyproject.toml files. Um, and then, uh, so you don't always have to uh, create your template uh, manual or have your ma manually create your template. You can use tools like Cookie Cutter, Hatch, and Poetry. And the thing which is cool with, um, so I know some of you have been using Cookie Cutter to generate uh, your templates. Um, these to do the same, but they can also do added stuff like uh, help you build and uh, distribute your code. So, oh, sorry, for example, hatch, uh, not here, yeah. So here is hatch. Um, yeah, so if you look at the sample commands, you can just, it's really easy. You can do hatch new my app and it creates your project with all the files that you need. And then eventually uh, there, yeah, it doesn't show all the commands, but you can actually distribute it, distribute your project. Uh, yeah, so you can create a virtual environment with Hatch um, and you can build and distribute your project, run test cases as well. So these are cool things to check. Uh, I believe they all use, so this one uses the setup.py, um, but uh, Poetry uses the, the Tomal file. So if you want to go on board or start with the Tomal stuff, then you can um, use poetry and it really simplifies uh, everything for you. So these are projects which are might be uh, worth looking at and um, to help you build and distribute your package. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, so, but we're going to follow the setup tools route. So first, uh, if you want to build your project, you probably want to consider making a GitHub release at that point, um, just so you don't, uh, so you have like a version uh, for the release that you've published to PyPy. Uh, you want to uh, ensure that the necessary packages are installed and up to date. So, um, what you need, you need setup tools and wheel. So you'll have to run this command, the pip install uh, upgrades of tools and wheels. And finally, um, you want to create uh, the source and build distribution archive. So the source distribution archive or is just uh, the source files and some metadata. Um, but when you create a wheel, it's essentially just the files that are ready to be used. They just need to be copied over to the right location. And so pip actually prefers, it's best to push both of them to PyPy, um, but pip will first try to find a wheel. If it doesn't, then it will uh, build from the source distribution. Question from Kendra, Valerie. When would you make these files? I assume the setup.py uh, and manifest and other ones, just at the end when the package functionality is all there, or do you update it as you work on the code and require more packages? So those packages can actually be, or sorry, those files can actually be created uh, at the beginning um, and then you'll edit it as you go along, um, depending on what your package needs. Uh, but it's okay if you do it at the end too, but in general, you can like uh, these files, or when you use uh, tools like Poetry and Hatch, these files will be created automatically with a bit of your project's meta metadata in there already. So like who's the author, 
um, what's the project name uh, and, if, and information like that. And then uh, finally, when you're ready to uh, distribute your project, then you'll look at your setup to apply, make sure that everything's in there, maybe add some stuff if anything has changed. Um, and yeah, and then you can, you're ready to build and uh, publish. Um, so it's kind of uh, as, as you want, I guess, start, like the best is to start off with those files and then just keep adding as you go along. Is that good? Also, maybe to add to that, sometimes you have to refactor a bit your, your directory structure to make it work in a package. Like let's say you had dependency, which were not, you know, under the root directory of your package or that type of things. So I, I agree with you, Valerie. I think it's good to, to, to set it up from the get go. Yeah. Okay, and then last thing is, um, so now your project is, um, is built, you have your source distribution and your build distribution, you're ready to publish it to PyPy for everyone to use. Um, so the steps are first, you'll wanna create an account at pypy.org. Uh, you can generate the API token so that it doesn't prompt you for a username and password when you wanna publish. Um, you'll have to install this and upgrade this package uploader called Twine. Um, so just a pip install Twine. And then upload the archives that you had created in the previous step. So everything that's located in your distribution folder. And then once that's done, uh, you can install your package from PyPy using pip and you should be able to find it uh, in PyPy. Um, now there's something that's cool and it's known as test.pypy.org. So if, um, yeah, so here, uh, this is my account and this is the test release that I had made. Um, but essentially, uh, this is a test version of PyPy. So if you wanna just practice publishing without actually publishing your project to PyPy, you can, you, you can just publish it to test PyPy and test the installation. And then finally, once you're ready, um, you can go ahead and publish it to PyPy. Um, so yeah. Is it, is it an option of Twine to publish to test PyPy? Yeah, so uh, you just have to pass it a flag saying that you want it to be in test PyPy because by default it'll push directly to PyPy. Mm -hmm. So if you pass a flag saying that you want it to be there, uh, it'll push it to test PyPy. Okay. And that maybe, is, oh, maybe sorry. We, we, uh, just thinking that maybe we could say too that once you've pushed something to PyPy, there is no going back. It's, it's, it's really only there. So you cannot delete something that you've put there. Uh, you cannot even publish uh, the package again with the same release number. And that's for good reasons. It's to avoid that things break because, you know, imagine that one of your dependency disappears tomorrow, then, you know, your code would break. And, and if it's a popular dependency, then a lot, a lot of, it, a lot of uh, Python packages may break. So yeah. it's once it's there on PyPy, if you discover a mistake, the only way ahead is to fix and then publish a new version, but the old one will remain there. Yep. Okay, so um, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll try it out ourselves. Um, so essentially I have this uh, or I had created this basically blank repo, which is supposed to emulate possibly where you've started from. And then from there, we'll go to final. It's still missing a license in here. Um, but yeah, where it's ready or like where it's been packaged and can be published to PyPy. So we'll start from master. I'll actually just end up recloning this. So sorry. All right, so all we have is this readme.md and this run.py. So first step is we want to um, make a package. So um, I'm gonna create the CMB package. 
Um, and I will, or yeah, and then so in there I'll create an init touch cmb um, slash init dot pi. And I will do, uh, and then I'll copy the, sorry, to cmb slash init dot pi. Uh, sorry, what am I doing? Okay, so there, so CMB just has, it's a package and it has my run.py file. Um, and then our next step is to create the setup tool file. So I actually link this introductory tutorial that is provided by Python um, for creating um, packages and we'll kind of use their template. Um, for set up the setup.py. So before I actually, uh, let's see. So I had taken a screenshot of this here uh, in my presentation here, we'll just copy the code. And there's a lot of things that you can actually include. Sorry. In your um, setup.py that aren't necessarily mentioned there. So. Okay, um, so here uh, it reads the README and it'll publish the contents of it to PyPy. Here um, we'll change it to, we'll change the project name. So I'll include the my name because it's being published to PyPy and I don't want it to be rejected in the push. So I'll just, I just put in a username. Um, but normally when you're publishing to PyPy, uh, you wouldn't actually want it to have your name in there. You just want uh, your tool name. Um, the thing you have to be careful is you have to make sure that it's a unique name. So you'll have to look through PyPy or do a pip search to see if anyone is using the name that you'd like to use. Um, and then example author. So Hillary, uh, we'll keep this the same. Cool stuff. Um, and I'll just, I'll remove the URL for now, but okay, so it is Python 3 has a MIT license and it's OS independent. We'll say it just requires, uh, Python requires greater than three, let's say, um, although it's not tested. And then I'll add an install requires because it has some dependencies. So it'll be uh, nibabel uh, numpy and hello. Uh, and that should be it. So now I have a setup.py file. I can do a pip install, uh, or I'm going to create my virtual env. So python vm.vm. Okay, uh, source slash activate. Okay, and now I can do a pip install. This should work. Uh, okay, sorry, it was just that. I'm actually gonna remove it. Uh, so. so now it's installing nibubble, numpy, pillow. I don't have a requirements.txt file at all. Uh, and it's installed everything. Now I can should be able to do Python um, from anywhere, but import cmb or from cmb.run import uh, color. And it works and I should be able to use my code if I had passed um, the necessarily it input and output. Uh, okay, and then, um, so now we can go ahead and um, try to build our project. 
So, and you can follow um, these commands. So here, this is actually, uh, if you want to um, publish it to test PyPy, they actually give you commands here. Um, so to do it, and that's what we'll end up doing. So I need to install setup tools and wheel. Setup tools. Okay, and then is it, uh, is it something that you recommend installing in the virtual environment as well? Setup tools and wheel, or I have them system wide, but I have a feeling that it creates some incompatibility sometimes. I mean, uh, technically, it shouldn't, um, in the sense that, like, uh I mean, I guess it's, you'd want to use the same setup tools and wheel for all your projects and it should run with, all your projects should be able to run with the same versions of setup tools and wheel. So I think you can install it system wide and it should be fine. I mean, even here they, rec I mean, what they're doing is they're recommend, it, well, they're installing it for the user. Uh, I don't necessarily think that there is a purpose for installing it directly into a virtual M. Okay. Um, so, okay. but I mean, either way works. I think uh, if I'm correct, I believe that uh, when uh, you create a virtual environment, it installs by default set of tools. Like, uh, see, I just created a virtual environment and it tells mm -hmm. me requirement already satisfied. So by default, okay. it's already there. And I think that's in the case that um, someone wants to build your code and it requires setup tools. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, it'll be installed on their system by default. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then, okay. So, and then we just need to run the setup.py, create our source distribution and our wheel. So now that's done, we should have a dist directory. Um, so you have the source distribution, which is the tar.gz file and my wheel. And you can look in here. So, uh, sorry, it's, yeah. And so, so you have some metadata stuff in your Egg info file. So it should have created some other things. So we have CMB HS egg info. Um, it has a requires.txt file, which should look just like your install requires. So you'll see you have nibubble, numpy, and pillow in there. Um, and yeah, and just some other metadata information. Okay, so now we have our uh, our distribution, well, our wheel, and we're ready to publish to PyPy. So we have to first pip install twine. It takes a while. And then it's just twine upload test PyPy, uh, or repository test PyPy slash distribution to Repository test pi 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 and then distribution. Um, so normally you don't need to pass the repository test pi pi um, if you're uploading it to pi pi directly um, here because I'm um, publishing it to test pi pi. I need to pass that or use that flag. Oh, okay, so it's complaining because I've already uploaded this project to PyPy. I can name it something differently, but either way, um, eventually it'll end up. You could bump the version number. Yeah. 2002. Sure. I mean, I can also rename it, but okay, so. 2002. We'll just go back. OK. 
Okay. Um, um, it's still, oh. Now it's uploaded. Okay. Um, um, then, yeah. And so now it's there, and we can install uh, here because it's on test PyPy. Um, we'll just do, uh, we have to tell it to install from test PyPy, and then it's called CMB. This works. Yeah, so uh, because I already had it installed, it's installed a uh, pip install upgrade. Let's see if that works. Okay, yeah, so now I installed the updated version of my package. Um, and so, yeah, so that's how uh, you create, uh, or those are the final steps of your project. So. Uh, yeah, basically, you need to make sure that the necessary files are there to install and additionally a license and a readme file. Then um, you need to use setup tools to um, create the source uh, archive and the build distribution archive, and then you can publish it to PyPy using Twine. Um, are there any more questions? Yes, it looks good. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I had one, we had talked about it before, but maybe just to clarify a bit, um, when should I create a, a Python package and when should I use Docker? Or rather, why do I need to create a Python package for my code if I can just create a Docker image and push it on Docker Hub? I feel like, or at least this is from my perspective, but the thing is, is I mean, well, pushing it to Py or creating a Python package is much more lightweight. Um, your package shouldn't be built to depend on a specific environment. And so you should test on multiple environments. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily need to have it in a Docker file and freeze uh, certain conditions for your uh, Python, such as the operating system or uh, certain packages for or, yeah, certain system packages for your Python package to work. Um, I th and it also makes it hard to uh, import. It adds a Docker dependency to your project. Um, mm -hmm. So then users need to install Docker. This is not necessarily super straightforward on Windows and it would mm -hmm. much be much more easier to just do a pip install. Um, if the, someone is writing Python code and wants to integrate your project in there, they have to start up a Docker process running a container um, yeah. rather than just doing an import. Mm -hmm. So I think generally it's preferable to just create a Python package. I mean, if you want it to be in a Docker container, you can always create a Docker container that installs your package. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't really limit anything, um, but it helps, it makes it easier to use and for yeah, for, and for people to integrate your code into their projects. Thanks. A uh, question from Kendra. If a package you make is used in your research project, should they be in different repositories? Um, so you mean you create a toolbox and then uh, some that can be used on many different things. Um, and then at the same time, uh, you're using it for your research project or if it's very specific to your research project. Um, because I mean, it depends on the case. I, If you're using a toolbox, which you can use for many different things, I would actually create a separate Python package, um, like in a separate repository and make reference to that within your research project. Um, but if it's tightly coupled with your research project, then you could have it in the same repository. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with that. If, uh, if it's meant to be reused in more than one thing, then make it a separate project. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other question?
if not, then I guess that concludes it. So thanks for attending. And our next step today are the project clinics at the usual time and place, so 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Feel free to send any more questions to Slack. And have a nice day, everybody. Yeah. Uh, I think there's oh. one more question. Uh, yeah. Oh. If your package is just meant for your research and uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, it's a question of if you want to, if your package should be used by other people, then I would recommend, um, I would recommend having it set up to pi, um, a manifest in that uh, removes maybe say your paper and then you can uh, publish it to PyPy. But I guess uh, like for, I guess for code, which I use for my own personal research, I don't necessarily create a Python package out of it um, because it's very specific to my research and I don't believe they'll be reused. But um, generally, uh, yeah, if it's code that you can reuse for other things, um, then yeah, create a sub.py and make a Python package out of it. One thing I'd just add to that as well is that um, I'm not sure if anyone has mentioned Zenodo over the course of the, um, well, course. Um, but, uh, but in general for like papers in particular, like the work I've done, you know, make my figures, do my analyses, whatever. Um, I agree with Valerie in that I tend to not make a package for those things, but I will always publish the code to Zenodo, which also is like read only. And that way there's a permanent record, even if I, you know, decide to, for some reason, rename my github repo or something like that there's always like a record of exactly what code was there so that's like a, a, another way that it's not necessarily about um, packaging or reusability but it's more just about provenance um, so zenodo is z-e-n-o-d-o if anyone's interested in that yeah that's a great point greg just to take an example from the um, from the A1 clinics that we have at 1 p.m. So we were talking there about um, file format conversion from MATLAB for EG from MATLAB to BIDS. And um, we had a discussion on Slack and eventually uh, Karim Jarbi mentioned that, you know, if, you do, if you're doing something and, and it would be nice to publish it so that others can reuse, this is a perfect case for a Python package. You know, even if it's only uh, the, 15 or 20 lines of code, you may think, oh, you know, it's, it's no big deal, but if you want other people to reuse that and to just, you know, depend on your library, import it in their projects, that should be a Python package mm -hmm. or part of another Python package. I mean, it doesn't have to be standalone, but it has to be, it has to be published somewhere on PyPy. Yeah.